Hi, my name is Aishi, and today I'll be talking about transduction and phosphorylation. So transduction is the process by which an initial signal is converted into a form that brings about the ultimate cellular, cellular response, as we covered in a previous lecture. And essentially this process is like a domino effect, where one step brings about um, the next step, and, and so after reception, or the binding of the ligand to the receptor, the receptor is activated in some way and is able to then activate another molecule, which activates another molecule, and so forth, passing the message along. Now remember that it's not the actual ligand itself that is being physically passed, but it's the information that is passed along. It's the information that the ligand has bound to the receptor. So, you know, transduction um, consists of multiple steps, allowing for amplification and regulation. So, imagine you have s molecule A that is activated. It can then it can then activate several molecule Bs, which can then activate even more molecule Cs. And because you have so many steps, you can have uh, you can have different interactions. For example, you can have another pathway that maybe produces even more molecule Cs, or you can have you know molecule G that converts C into um, another form that is unable to activate D in, in the initial pathway. So it allows for you know this signal to be amplified and for additional regulation. Usually, shape change in proteins in this pathway are, is what allows the message to pass along. And a very important method of bringing about this change is phosphorylation. And what brings about phosphorylation? Well, these are enzymes called protein kinases. So these are enzymes that transfer, uh, transfer a phosphate group from ATP to another protein. We actually talked about kinases in a previous lecture on reception. We talked about receptor tyrosine kinases, which are able to phosphorylate tyrosine residues um, on each other in the dimer form. So Normally, in cytoplasmic kinases, the residues that are being phosphorylated are usually the serines and the threonines. And in fact, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of different kinases being made in the cell, and it, it actually makes up a large part of our genome. In fact, 2% of our genes code for protein kinases. Now, protein phosphatases are essentially the opposite of protein kinases. They remove phosphate groups from a protein. Oftentimes in transduction, we'll have a phosphorylation, phosphorylation cascade happening, where there are a series of phosphorylation events happening one by one. So in this example, we have the relay, relay molecule um, causing the activation of one kinase by phosphorylation. And this phosphorylated form of the kinase is active and can then phosphorylate other kinases, which then become active, and then can activate other kinases, eventually leading to um, a step that will cause the cellular response. So again, it's the kinase that adds the, the phosphate group onto the protein and the phosphatase that removes it. Now in the example that we just covered, it was the phosphorylated form of the protein that was active and the uh, non-phosphorylated form that was inactive. However, phosphorylation can cause the protein to become active or it can cause it to become inactive. So in other cases, you might find that phosphorylation actually inactivates the protein, while 
removing the phosphate group using a phosphatase will actually activate it. Now, proteins can also be um, phosphorylated several times you can, by different kinases. So you can have one kinase adding several phosphate groups, or you can have uh, different kinases adding you know, different ones. For example, one kinase might add this phosphate group, another kinase might add this one over here, and you know, this phosphate group might be activating and this phosphate group might be inhibitory. And in the same sense, you can have different phosphatases that will remove different phosphate groups.